I'm going to Sorry, call the meeting to order and to my right is our council president, Lori Dwight, and to my left is Councilor Eugene Tacey from Ward 7, and I'm City Councilor Marianne Barge from Ward 6 in the chair. And thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to announce Ruth McGrath. She is doing the audio video recording for Adam Cohen on the North Street Association. So, we need to do the approval of minutes of June 17th. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Got it. No. Thank you again for being here. We don't have to wait till 5 10 to get on the agenda, do we? Yeah. Let's right. move along. We can even schedule that 5 10 meeting. Right. We can move on. No, uh, we have to adjourn and go home. Yeah. Oh, yay! <laughs> I, can't, I can't hear consultation because of. I know. Yeah. I don't know. That's why I don't know all the audio is going to be on that. That's why I think the band went out a couple of lashes. Okay. John, don't have time to talk to us. Councilman Barge, thank you very much for inviting us. And Councilman Casey and Councilman White, I appreciate you being here tonight. Um, when, uh, when you asked me to come here two years ago, I had a much more formal presentation for you, which included charts and graphs and stuff like that. And, and uh, I appreciate, Councilman Lavarge, that you um, allowed me not to do that this time, but rather to give you an overview, provided I was able to bring some staff members with me. Um, and uh, uh, I want to thank um, my staff and introduce them. Um, Lisa Felty is the director of our Section 8 East Housing and BASH Programs Office. Uh, John McKemmy is our Mixed Population Service Coordinator, John's a social worker. And Michelle Moriarty, who uh, many of you may remember as a, when she was a member of the Northampton Police Department, is um, our uh, Lease Implementation Coordinator, which is another way of saying she enforces the lease. Um, I was hoping today that what we can do is to talk a little bit about the kinds of work that we do and how uh, Michelle, particularly Michelle and John interact and work together. Um, but Gary Ann also asked me to talk a little bit about our budget, um, and I will do that, and then introduce these guys to, to talk and then answer your questions. And please interrupt me at any time. Um, the Housing Authority serves the needs of 618 households living in NHA housing, um, uh, including Salva House, McDonald House, Hampshire uh, Heights, Florence Heights, Cahill Apartments, Fort Sander Apartments, and Tobin Manor as well as some smaller housing now on Bridge Street, on State Street. Um, uh, and um, uh, we also um, serve 683 households as of today, 684 as of five minutes ago, um, in our Section 8 program with both our conventional Section 8 program and our um, Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing program. For the Section 8 program, we supplement the rent payments to private landlords of approximately $4.4 million a year. So we're pumping about $4.4 million into the economy in an effort to assist uh, low-income families and individuals um, get and maintain housing. Um, the average rent, uh, conversely, paid by our public housing tenants is only $280 a month, which, per, which assists those 615 or 618 families to be allowed to live in a very expensive market um, at a at a uh, reasonable cost that meets with their ability to pay. I think I a some question. Sure, John. Of the Section 8s that you, 4.4 million in private landlords, that's for Section 8 subsidies? Yes, that's the half thing. How much oversight do you have after it leaves you, after it goes? Uh, and can, you, can you be a little more specific? Well, uh, you don't do any inspections of these places, do you? Yes, we do. You do? We do an annual inspection uh, of the housing units to meet what HUD refers to as housing quality standards. Yeah. And we, we utilize the state sanitary code and the building code as the, as the marker for those inspections. Okay. And you said 618 units you have? Pub, uh, public housing units. Public housing. Yeah. And then you, you, you said 684 something else. Section 8 budget. Section 8. So that's all this 4.4 million. The 4.4 million is the Section 8 vouchers. Okay. Uh, the total budget for our public housing is about 2.6, 2.7 million. Thank you. So that's uh, that's rents coming in from our residents and subsidy from the local, federal, and state governments. That's how you get to that 2.7. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, 
this year we will be performing about $800,000 in modernization work, roofs at, new roofs at Fort Sander, new boilers at Fort Sander, uh, and Tobin Manor, and handicapped access projects at our Ridge Street, Tobin Manor, and Grace House developments. Um, we just finished completed a project uh, refurbishing some sidewalks on Fruit Street um, and doing some um, uh, tile replacement in the corridors there as well. In addition, in the last 12 months, we've overseen about $100,000 in energy conservation work, working with Chris Mason, um, who's the city's energy sustainability coordinator. Um, he's ours for one day a week, and we really appreciate the fact that the city, uh, Dave Pomerantz and, and the city, have been able to work out an arrangement where um, we can uh, rent him for uh, a day a week. Um, and I think that's worked out well for Chris, who now has a full-time job, and has worked out well for the city and for the housing authority. Apparently, we Well, yeah. he's on vacation right now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's you, don't, you, you, don't, you don't swap any funds or anything back and forth. Like we pay the city for, um, for, for one day. day of this time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I also want to thank the, the members of the city council for approving the CDBG grant application a year ago, which provided us with about $6,000 to improve the kitchen at Grace House. That was uh, part of a $25,000 project. We uh, put in $19,000, the city put in six, and we were able to put stainless steel counters um, uh, in, in, in there, which really is uh, a new cabinet which really is a benefit to uh, the residents there. That place gets a lot of heavy use, hard use, and stainless steel counters um, will last. Um, and so we think that really helps the, the development. Um, while the city generally provides no funds for the housing authority, um, as we are a creation of the city. The city council is the one who, uh, who voted to establish our charter. And as such, we take our responsibility to manage our housing very seriously. We perform criminal record checks on our applicants. Um, we have to attempt to ensure that they will uh, uh, be able to live in a neighborhood safely, um, and that uh, both Hampshire and Florence sites will remain good places for kids to grow up in. Um, and we also uh, want our elderly developments to be safe for our senior citizens. We have a responsibility to provide housing opportunities for those folks, as well as some of our younger disabled clients um, who we serve. Um, our major challenges over the next few years are largely financial. We have faced federal budget cuts, and we are one of the people who are uh, receiving sequestration cuts. Um, I was talking to Lisa a little bit earlier the way in which they fund the Section 8 program is such that we did not learn until four weeks ago how much money we were going to be receiving this calendar year, 2013. We found out in late June how much money we were going to receive for the calendar year for our Section 8 program. Um, we are um, projected to uh, utilize all but $13,000 of that $4.4 million. Um, they want you to have reserve levels of about $400,000. We will end up with a reserve of about $13,000 this calendar. Um, the the uh, budget cuts in, in Boston um, over the last seven years um, still uh, hurt us considerably. We were able this year to hire a new um, maintenance guy, um, which is really helping in terms of speeding the turnover of our vacant units and also of keeping our developments looking a little bit nicer. We had, we, we always do this, but we only had one more guy. I'm sure you hear that from every department head in the city. We only had one more guy. Um, if we only had one more guy, we could be um, doing more in terms of upkeep. And maintenance. As the, so as they cut your budget, your 4.4 million, they, they trim away at that. So what do you tell people? No, or, or, or what about the people that are already placed? Well, that's, that's 
that is the that is the challenge that we face. Uh, we have a, a, a total allocation of 710, 740, 730, 730 vouchers. We're only going to be using about seven, yeah. We're only going to be using about 717 of them by the end of this calendar year because we don't have the money for the remainder. So we're not we're we're not issuing. So the 717 takes you to the max. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, uh, we're concerned about what happens in January of next calendar year in terms of funding. Um, there are housing authorities that are terminating people from their Section 8 programs. Um, and we've been fortunate that we've been, we have the NRA, the reserve levels, so that we haven't had to do that. Um, and I think we can get through without doing that. Here's what we have done. We have not provided landlords with rent increases uh, uh, over the last, uh, that started in March. Um, we have not issued, uh, reissued um, vouchers to, uh, to people who have, whose search time has expired. We What's give that people, when you give someone a voucher, they have 60 days to use it. You can then grant them an extension. That period of time that they can go looking is called search time. And if somebody's not using it, we're not reissuing it to them. Um, and we've not reissued vouchers. Um, we don't have money. Does that go by income on the vouchers? Does what go by income? Yeah, when you're giving out vouchers. Yes. Okay, it strictly goes by income. So you, you need to be income eligible in order to be eligible for the program. So, what is the amount of money that actually accumulates where you are entitled to be in that program? Okay. So, what is the pay scale? Oh, you mean what's your eligible? What do you? What's yeah, your income limit? Um, a family of four is about. We have updated income limits. We have that every year, but I don't know. I don't. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's actually about sixty thousand dollars, I believe, for a family of four. But they would only get set by. No, these are these are federal standards <coughs> based on population and income. So. They don't, they don't set the voucher qualification. Our average income for families, because we have to, we have uh, um, we have something called the concentration of poverty, um, which means we need to house seventy five percent of our vouchers need to be issued to families in the lowest twenty percent of the income scale. Our average income for our families is approximately eighteen thousand dollars a year. How much? Eighty. 18. 18. Might be better. I was wondering. Yeah. I'm eligible. I'm eligible. <laughs> but you might remember the section. Uh, the section eight program provides your subsidy. The lower your income, the more subsidy on your rent. On your rent. What what disqualifies you from If you're already existing, if you guys are not renewing, what what are the disqualifications? Uh, how do, basically, how do you vet? Who gets cut? We haven't we haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so no, when I say we're we're, no, we're no. not reissuing, that means that if, if your search time is up, we're not letting okay. giving you an extension. So, except you need, for a reasonable yeah. time. You need the terms, then you need to qualify. And there is a waiting list, but the waiting you're not referring to that. Yeah, no waiting list. Well, it's closed. It's open in those six. It's been closed since those six. We have about forty-five. We had, we had hoped to open our waiting list in the spring to refill the vessel um, because of sequestration. We're, if that waiting list isn't moving, there's no reason to add another 600 people to that waiting list. So, How many empty apartments do you have right now? Seven. Seven out of all the apartments? Out of 618. Is that public? That's public housing. 
and they are in some form of repair or, or work done or uh, some of them are getting ready. Just become vacant. All yep. of them except for 18 Portisella Street um, is, are in some form of, uh, of rehabilitation. Yeah, yeah. With an average turnover time of about 20 days. Well, you need to do that. Quick. Well, you need to do that, John. Who moves out? You go in and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. So let me introduce Lisa Felty. Lisa, um, uh, Lisa runs our leased housing and bash programs. Um, uh, Lisa is also the treasurer of an organization which dovetails with the bash program called Homeward Vets. Her husband's the president, um, which provides uh, furniture for um, veterans who are going from being homeless into an apartment of their own. And Lisa's got kind of reluctant to share the story, but. Uh, Homeward Vets started when Lisa and her husband and a social worker from the VA discovered a need. When somebody said, you know, when they move in, they don't have any furniture. And Lisa's husband, David, picked up the ball from there, and um, it's been wonderful for the veterans and uh, a great companion organization to work with our VAT program. So, Lisa, you want to talk a little bit about the BASH program and about Section 8 program? The BASH is, um, stands for Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing, and back in 08, we were given um, 70 vouchers in 08 to house um, chronically homeless veterans. And so, we've been handling that program for five years, and as of today, we have um, 230 vouchers. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay. They uh, being the HUD uh, boss. Uh, the HUD boss. I, the, I, can, I, can I jump in for a minute? Sure. Um, the VASH <laughs> program. The VASH program started because um, members of Congress decided that they were tired of reading stories about homeless veterans, and so John Olber, to his eternal credit, um, said, "Well, gee." If we get them mental health counseling, and if we get them physical fitness and health care, and they agree to stay in the program and go to AA meetings and other substance abuse counseling uh, for whatever reason that they're homeless, why don't we give them a voucher? And this program has now served about uh, 80,000 veterans nationwide. Uh, cut the number of homeless veterans by a third, um, which means there's a long way to go, but um, and, and the low-hanging fruit gets eaten first. Um, so uh, the tough ones are to come. But the people in HUD, uh, in Boston in particular, didn't think this was going to be a good program. And uh, we and uh, the Cambridge Housing Authority and Boston Housing Authority have proven Sorry to interrupt. And that's what, then I have a question. You said to be eligible for this program, they can't be a registered sex offender. So what does the housing authority do as a whole when you have applicants that are registered sex offenders? Do you? They're denied. They're denied. Across the board. Okay. Except for I had, I had to hear you say it. Except for bad. No. Except for bad. No, they're all denied. Yes, everybody's denied. Correct. And they're not eligible for any Section 8 vouchers? No, they're not. They, it's statutory. Right. Uh, uh, that whether if you are on a sex offender registry in any of the 50 states uh, or commonwealths, or if you were ever convicted of production or distribution of methamphetamines, you are statutorily prohibited from receiving housing assistance through HUD programs. Those are the only two statutory reasons to deny someone for public housing. Thank you. Lisa, can I ask you, say with a veteran who is being taken care of at the VA hospital, is under a voucher, but what if they are married and have a family and they need housing to be treated? Are there families in the VASH program? Yes, we have families in the VASH It's just not simple veterans. How many do you have? Uh, offhand, I guess, I would say 25, maybe. Easy for them to stick it out. They take about 50 They can. We don't. We do have turnover, but the turnover is that um, they received like, a higher pension and they end up paying the full rent. And you can only be on the program for six months paying the full rent. And then your voucher is you go. You know, you continue to, you know. Or, or they bomb out. Right. Or actually, it's the highest of them are them leaving because they're paying the full rent. And then that frees up another one. And the VA pulls it off their interest pool. And then we're going to give them another voucher. Any mm -hmm. questions or bash questions? Okay. Cat chasing its tail, I can see this the revolving door, huh? Well, yeah, but the idea shouldn't be, and you're absolutely right, and I think you'll agree that the idea shouldn't be that somebody stays with a housing subsidy forever. If their pension, if, if you can get someone from living underneath the bridge into a VA hospital where they receive the medical care, psychological counseling, the substance abuse counseling, and get them on a VA pension with, that they earn, yeah. and then get them started in, in rental housing, and then have them move off because their pension is such or they get a job, that's what it's all about. Perfect. That's the, that's the kind of transition yeah. I think we all want. Yeah. We don't want people who are third or fourth generation Section 8 recipients. How come they're not on a pension? Um, well, 
for one thing, right now I think there's a one and a half year wait between the time you file your paperwork and the time the Veterans Administration deals with you. Is it two years? Yeah. People yeah, follow up. Combat up. That's the yeah. yeah. and, and people who people who have come back with uh, post traumatic stress disorder or other or other um, uh, or other uh, psychological disorders are the ones that fall off the face of the earth. Uh, and and many that have become eligible, they can't find it. That's right. They can't find it. That's right. Yeah. And finally, finally, we have a program that has a lot, that allows us to marry the, the the services of street workers. You know, the, the people who are homeless street workers. Yeah. Um, and the Veterans Administration and the housing administration, the housing subsidy administrator, yeah. that will allow them to stay in an apartment. sitting in this room and for the governor to believe that he's going to reorganize the smaller housing authorities out of business and we're not one of the smaller housing authorities we're actually one of the larger housing authorities in Massachusetts uh, it's the smaller communities that haven't met their 40b targets and if he thinks that that uh, reorganizing them uh, by creating a you know six regions uh, is going to help that situation. He's crazy, um, and uh, I don't mind saying that uh, for, uh, for for the camera. Um, it's okay, there, but, but, there is, the but there is a but the problem. The real problem is that since the the occurrence in Chelsea, um, where that what they need to do is to recognize that they have some culpability in this as well. The state auditor's office was aware of what he was taking home, and I think DHCD was aware of what they, of what he was making. Um, you put him in jail. You right. don't punish the other housing authorities in the state. Um, are there efficiencies that could be derived from regionalizing? Yes, absolutely. 
and, and we, we're willing to do those things. We're, in, we're involved in cooperative purchasing arrangements. Um, one of the things the state could do is centralize the purchase of utilities. I think it's crazy that I have to understand um, oil futures. So I'm buying, that, I'm buying natural gas on the three-year spot market. I'm sorry, I don't understand that stuff. Um, and, and, I, and I don't know if I'm any good at it. But it's part of my job. It's something the state should do. Um, uh, so are there things that we could reform and, and economize? Yes. But I think it's important that you have a local housing authority that meets every month, that your tenants and your citizens come and say, hey, you guys need to fix this. Because I don't think that you're going to get too many tenants going down to Springfield for the monthly meeting of, you know, Region 6 of DHCD. Yeah. So that's my opinion on reorganization. Um, let me introduce John McKemmy, who is our Mixed Population Service Coordinator, um, and Michelle Moriarty, and they want to, I think, probably do this together. Because they will. Go ahead. Yeah, you can jump in. Again, I'm John, and Mixed Population Service Coordinator, which is kind of a mouthful. Well, that, that's what it is, Mixed Population Service Board. I'm a licensed social worker. And the reason it's called Mixed Population Service Coordinator originally is because the tendency is elders and young disabled. And I believe that's why it's now called a Mixed Pop. Okay. And I dare say that probably the young disabled, a large percentage, the larger percentage of the young disabled are not so much physically disabled, but really mental health. So that, that's, your com that's your combination of the tenants. Um, I've been here almost 16 years. Uh, my position is funded by the, a grant from DHCD, and I cover five buildings. Salvo, Cahill, McDonald House, and then up in Florence, Fort Sander, and Jumbo. So you don't handle Food Street? What's yeah, the yeah. name of that place? Cahill Apartments is Food Street. Yes. That's Cahill. Okay. Cahill Apartments, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so five complexes for a total of 435 apartments in those, in those complexes. Um, I would like to say, just, just one quick thing, is one of, the, one of the basic philosophies I bring to sort of my work and my job is I think, I always think that life is difficult enough. We, have, we all have stresses and pressures in our lives, and the great thing is that we should all be able to retreat, so to speak, back to our home you know, to the safety and security of a home to get away from life pressures and stresses that we all occasionally have. And I think for those 435 people, our apartments are their homes. So, you know, they, like everybody else, that should be their retreat for peace. And so therefore, Michelle and I and everybody else tries to do whatever we can to help solve problems and situations that arise. Basically, I do two things. Basically, is I help tenants with hook them up with services that might be available and advantageous to them, and secondly, also occasionally deal with problems and situations, disputes that come up between the tenants. And first of all, as far as hooking people up with services, I'm always constantly dealing with the area agencies. Highland Valley Elder Service, the Nurse Association, DMH, the VA. Uh, ServiceNet, do you deal with them at all? ServiceNet? Constantly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, ServiceNet, which is the, the, health, the main mental health provider, constantly dealing with therapists from that agency also. Yeah. yeah. So all those agencies, we constantly interact with. And again, in an attempt to help set up services or help solve problems, that arise with the tenants. So that's setting up the services. And then secondly, as far as uh, helping to solve any problems and disputes that come up, it certainly runs the gamut. It, as you can imagine, it, it, it runs the gamut from simple stuff like he or she is playing a music too loud at 3 in the morning. And I know they're doing it on purpose to ignore you. Or totally to the other end of the spectrum, of certainly serious life-threatening situations, such as calling the paramedics because a tenant 
doesn't seem right and is going into a diabetic coma. Or calling emergency services because a tenant is suicidal. So truly, it runs the whole, it really runs the whole game you know, from simple things to some pretty heavy duty serious life situations. Are you on call 24 hours a day? No, we're not. No, no, we're not. We work Monday through Friday. So, if anything occurs during the night, right. are you notified? No, Michelle and I uh, always say, if anything, if anything happens after hours, please call the police. And that's right. Part of my job, I'm the lease implementation coordinator. I was a former police officer for the city of Northampton. So I have access to what's called the IMC, which is the computer system for the police station. So I can look up all our properties and see what happened over the weekend, so say, when I was in here on my days off. And again, it runs the gamut. And I, I deal with everything John deals with, plus Hampshire Heights and Florence Heights, the family housings, which are a different animal than the young and disabled the elderly, different problems. So it can run the gamut from a disturbance, a fight, a fist fight between people or other guests. We have a lot of issue with people's guests. They, they tend to fight some drug-related things all the way to, I have tenants call me to say that somebody's flushing their toilet six times a night. It's disturbing them. Or people not signing their paperwork when they should. So as what I do as well, it runs the gamut. When there is an issue with somebody with a disability, I try to, before I called them in, called them in which call, called a private conference. A private conference is an informal conference uh, to find out their side of the story. I have a police report here that says you were fighting with your neighbor at two in the morning. Tell me what happened. And I get their story. And if there's a mental health issue and I have access to service providers, I contact them. So, you know, I'm noticing there's, this person is having more disturbances. They're, they tend to be fighting with people more. What's happening? Is there you know, a med review coming up? Is there anything that we can do on our end? and I may also contact John McKinney. If it's an elder issue, I sometimes have elderly who are acting very bizarrely to where the police get called, and I try to find out if they're having dementia issues. Again, I talked to John McKinney, who may have some services for them. Michelle and I work very closely and interact. And when I was a police officer, I was a community police officer for Selma, so I've known John a very long time. Right. We worked together years, oh, yeah. many, many years. So again, we do, it does run the gamut for what I do. Um, I probably do 150 private conferences a year, and again, it runs the gamut. I may call people because they haven't done the paperwork that's required by lease. They may have um, three inspections, their annual inspections that they failed. And David Adamson, who's our maintenance director, may say, you know what, I've dealt with them three times, please deal with this. And I go, and I, I will go and look for myself to see what the issue is. It could be a dirty oven, or it could be a board of health problem. It could be, you know, something very severe. So. If I, that's the case, you know, I talk to the person, we try to find out if it's a mental health issue or if they're a hoarder. Again, I work with John McKinney to try to get um, housekeeping services if that's on the table. If it's not, because I do have tenants who absolutely refuse help. I'm not taking help, I can do it myself, and they refuse me. Part of it is a mental illness. So that's the point where I do start the eviction process, which starts with the private conference. And our hope is, a lot of times, to get to court and have court order help. So a judge will sign off saying, if you want to remain housed, you need to do A, B, and C and take services from either service net, housekeeper, whatever it is that they decide. So that's another thing that I do. Oh, interrupt me too. Go ahead. Yeah. So say at the McDonald's house, they have an association in, correct? Correct. Now at Cahill, do they have an association there? Cahill does not. It's not right now. Salvo does. Salvo does. Tobin does. Four Four Sander does. Okay, right now there's just McDonald's house does? Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Because um, we have a resident who comes to our Commission on Disability. She's here and had some concerns. Mm -hmm. And I've asked her to attend this meeting. I'm very happy that she is here. That if she had any questions, that she could bring them forth and possibly sure. get some help with it. So I'm going to open it up to the public, and would you like to say? I'll be glad to answer any questions Joyce has. First of all, can you what's your name? Joyce Cahill. I have more statements than questions. Uh, 
about my observations, and I'm glad that John brought up um, Chelsea because I'm amazed at the blank looks. I get outraged. I know I'm housing, I'm grateful, but I have been a taxpayer, and we all pay sales tax, so we're all taxpayers. And um, I just want to paraphrase before I speak. If I use words like disabilities, uh, homeless, and mental health, which I was born into, I'm pretty familiar with mental health. I'm not speaking with lack of compassion. I know about the suffering of all. And let's face it, there's way drugs, prescription, and um, and street drugs are used to solve problems as a way of life. It's really changed our society. So this is not against anyone here, but I'm kind of the grassroots representative, and I got quite an earful. And it doesn't mean other people aren't doing their job. I'm criticizing some of the policies and procedures that cause the problem. Um, and, I, and I say everyone who's working, is, most people are dedicated. But here are some of my questions, not necessarily here. Financial, embezzlement. How does it, Springfield had seven million. They're under a million dollar uh, 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 loss of public trust in housing. Since that seven million, now we have five million. And as a very learned person said on PBS, when money is taken from any public trust and embezzled, it got to double it because the people usually never put it back. And the services you're supposed to receive don't happen or happen later, and they set everything in a domino. And then, John, this is not a criticism of housing, but there are people who are living in housing in Salvo and Cahill who are not officially residents. And a worse problem is happening in Cahill residence problem created by residents, not by anybody in housing. They're taking in homeless people overnight. They stay during the day. Um, the homeless people, if they are even homeless, sneak in because it's an operated door. Uh, the councilman that we have has sat in, and I've listened to complaints about the first floor, people coming home later at night. They don't know who they're going to meet because a lot of people they meet are not residents. This is a serious issue, changing from elderly to all populations, and I'm not criticizing or saying most people shouldn't have a house, but I think a lot of policies, tie ins uh, and for safety, I think I brought up the most, I think 600 people, uh, it's 400, I thought it was 600 for one social worker. It doesn't make sense to me, but that's another issue. It's hard to keep things smooth. I know Michelle and John and, and John say they do. But there are a lot of interpersonal conflicts that are ending up in court. And I don't understand why. I wonder if we ought to have a professional, and that's just an against them. This is just an adjunct, mediator type of involvement. So these, these someone, I mean, I've heard someone at our place called the police because they're newspaper was stolen. So a lot of this is yeah, resident oriented, but if I were the policeman, I'd say, you know, give it time. So those things, the police are at our place of constant, and some are necessary, but perhaps it's just, you know, guess. Um, and I think I was married personally, my family and friends want to help someone for suicide. The person had to have the gun in their mouth and the trigger half pulled before somebody realized you ought to get there sooner. So that's one aspect, but I think the legal part that HIPAA is interfering or people are misinterpreting or they're afraid of being sued, I don't see any uh, emphasis on what's the common good. Like for what's going on in South, the people are afraid of some of those people. Nothing personal. They bring in infection. They may be stealing. They're trying to lose money. If they came in, like, you know, in at 9 and left at 7, but that is and let's see, the common good, I, I just don't understand why that doesn't seem, it's not just here, across the country, the common good seems to have gone to the, to the, uh, to the dogs, apparently. And as a person at the, especially the police, we have a case where the gentleman, a brilliant guy who suffers from delusions, his, 
his neighbors, yeah, he drives me crazy, but they care about him too. So they call, chick chat, chick chat. Second call, chick chat, chick chat. Not until he gets to, you know, that point of the suicidal person putting the gun in the mouth. Not until he's really ready to blow or threatens to burn down the place or whatever it is. He's never done that. That's when they're taken away. And that's what I question about HIPAA, not the HIPAA policy. It is so rigid. I have not experienced such rigidity in another state. So I don't know if that's how we interpret. I admit I have so much to learn. What does the HIPAA acronym stand for? Uh, no. And so I just, I just want to quote. Uh, what, yeah, no, I was, I was asking her. What, yeah. what does the HIPAA acronym stand for? I think it's Health, so I am Alive, Personal Privacy Act. That's why the husband can go to the doctor if, his wife, if he doesn't want his wife to know. The cases where a, a family wants to get um, their the legal authority because their parent is not well, when they bring that parent to court, although they have a better method now, the judge thinks they want the money. No, they don't want their parent falling down the stairs or burning down the house. Same thing with HIPAA. In some cases, the policeman is allowed to make a judgment on the spot. He's been trained or she's been trained. And they just see that. And I'm questioning. And again, I hear about all these rights. I argue with the Freedom Center. We know you have your rights, but as a family, we pick up your pieces. And at some point, you have some responsibility. We're sorry for your illness. I work with children with special needs. When they acted out, when it was over, I heard the words, I'm sorry. You ask them to be responsible, even if they can't. In my city, that's my experience. And if I'm really uh, very, very, we had one case at the McDonald House. John and I disagree. But from the mayor's office, the maternal general's office, the safety this and the elder abuse that, we had seven women being taken or threatened with going to court, being accused of harassment by, and this is an in the trench person, if you listen to what the person said and observed him, he was in the state of paranoia, accusing them of harassment. And I understand it's happened again. I was devastated to hear, this was a case of he said, she said. These seven women, they've been productive, they're intelligent. One person worked in a prison, another one was a teacher. These are not women with nothing to do. And they sat in their apartment because this person has a devious mind, which is a part of the illness. It's a one who can plan. He's not like the man I mentioned. He, the person I mentioned who on the third call gets taken, he doesn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to threaten to break this, you know, burn this building. This particular person has the ability to reason this plan. And I'm really, um, I believe he's starting up again. That's just for me. So those are my concerns with no criticism because there's something very wrong with policies from the law. Well, the, and, and thank and, you. And, and to that point, it goes to the point that in most of these things are policies that are actually mandated by the federal agencies and state agencies. And some of them are distinctly dedicated for uh, federal housing. So right, but are we going to stand by forever? This, this embezzlement in Springfield was quite some time ago. I, we wrote to two, two representatives. No, I'm going to say, I never had such shoulder shrugging when we were searching for these women, as I see in the uh, exercise room. Nobody wants to get involved in housing in general. It's a sacred cow. Well, for if I may, if I may, I'm sorry, that's what I was trying to say was, first of all, I suppose it's a shoulder shrug on some level, because what happened, I actually feel somewhat uncomfortable that these guys are here, because we have no authority over the housing authority. Right to your Excuse me, and let me finish. And we have. In fact, actually, we've, we've discussed this, and in fact, the person you're referring to, I've been on the receiving end from the same person from uh, a harassment order as well. So I'm, I'm not unfamiliar with the circumstances or what you're talking about, but then I get really, really uncomfortable when in this form that we start talking about individual cases and individuals who may or may not be liable. First of all, we're not qualified to determine that or act on it for that matter. Because, and, and let me explain it this way. Any landlord in the city of North Carolina, now there, there are lots of landlords in the 
city that have lots of regulations. This landlord has even more than that because of all the all the associated uh, responsibilities associated with federally subsidized housing. But we have no authority over an individual landlord other beyond making sure they abide by all of the city codes for construction and things like that. And then as far as the police go, the same thing. And I think what, what John and Michelle are describing in, in, in John Hyde and what you're experiencing are is a unique concentration, albeit unpleasant concentration, of uh, mixed populations that in close proximity some people with a variety of challenges in their lives to manifest in, 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 in conflict that you could, in another household in the city that's managed by a landlord, probably that landlord would have more leeway to address them. These guys have bigger challenges. I agree with you. Underfunded, understaffed, uh, underappreciated, and I think, and perhaps overregulated. And so as far as your address is, what serves is, is simply an address because beyond doing what you're saying, which we have done, is advocating to, to uh, Peter Polkow, to Stan Rosenberg, uh, our congressman to McGovern, the, the authorities beyond advocating to say, really, you know, you, you combine sequestration, you combine unfunded mandates, you combine with that uh, uh, all the manifest problems that you've had historically with uh, subsidized housing, and you you get surprise surprise, you get these enormous problems. I don't need to be told that you're not telling me anything I don't already know. I came here to let somebody realize how tough it is for them, how tough it is for us. I'm asking you to spread the word. You may believe in some of the people you contacted. I, I haven't found anyone in Northampton who has fight.
oh, I don't know, what was it two years ago? And, I, and we talked about it at the beginning, because we're about to go over it again. And Bill said to this person, so, who's your caseworker? And this person said, you know, and I'm almost going to quote him, you know, that's a good question. It seems that every time the Department of Mental Health reorganizes, I seem to get farther and farther away from an actual caseworker. Is that what you said? Yeah. We're failing these people. No, and, 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 they didn't ask and I don't know what the answer to this is. Right. I mean, I've worked it. I understand. And they close the institutions from DMH and DMR. Okay. Their living conditions were not the greatest. And it was the best thing that they ever did by opening up those doors and letting them have a good quality of life of having their own home or whatever. I think what she's trying to say, which I think you will agree with me, John, way back, it was used for seniors. Yeah. Okay, McDonald's house, strictly used for seniors. Seniors and people with disabilities exactly. which meant physical disabilities. Exactly. And all of a sudden, this big change. And I think, and I can see where she's coming at, of problems. It has nothing to do with your department or anything. I really do think that the state needs to look at somehow changing their rules because it is causing a problem. I agree with you. What they, one of the rules they need to to, um, to figure out is how it is that someone who is a client of the Department of Mental Health can fire the department. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, I remember the buzzword at the time. It was mainstreaming. Yeah. Was they, they stopped using deinstitutionalization. They came out with mainstreaming. But main, they tried it in the public schools and they tried it everywhere. It doesn't work. Well, it would work if they had. It would work if they would have the, the, the services available. Services in place yeah. to make sure that people were taking their medications and doing the things around their house that they may have weaknesses. I mean, I gotta tell you, Gene, if you came in and looked at my living room today, you would order that I have services. Okay. I'll tell you. And we need we need to do that for a lot of our, our residents. We try. And Michelle and John You don't spend, I, I know you don't have the staff and have the funding. That. My office is substantially worse than your living room. But I remember we fought like hell with Peter Colcutt for an additional two million dollars in the budget for our mental health. And it was like Marianne LaBarge and I sat in the, in the hearing room here and uh, he finally says, okay, uh, we'll see what we can do. But two million dollars spread across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is zero. I mean, it's like nothing compared to the problem that is out there. You could blow through $2 million in the Northampton Housing Authority overnight if you wanted to. No, I don't think so, but half of it. You bet. I know darn well you could. I mean, I, it's really, I it's really not much fun. And I think we spoke on the phone. We spoke in person about the social job. This is not about you, about what you could be. We had a problem with it. We had a social worker. That's right. There weren't that many of these kinds of problems, as many here. But there were problems. That person could help the elderly, like John is. I think one of the problems is when people get very unwell, the ability to reason goes. And as I said, they have the right to refuse. You can buy a palace for people. They say, I refuse to live there. I prefer to live in the swamp. But someone else with more knowledge needs to check this out. But I believe that this idea of freedom, which I'm all for freedom, but when it's bothering other people, and it's supervised housing would be ideal for the fellow that cracks every once in a while, he really needs to be in a supervised living condition. Whether he likes it or not, his behavior becomes inappropriate for the general public. Maybe like you only have one social worker, which is Mr. McKinney, correct? Right. Have you ever thought about maybe getting something to me? Me? Actually, if I may, they have a process. It's not a very fast process. It's process mandated by law. 
uh, as I said, if I were a landlord, I could simply go, sorry, you got to go. But the, the, they have a, a very, very fair hearing process, and with and they can't they can't force people to take services, as you said, and they can't they uh, it's they're left mostly with trying to negotiate, which is what you're witnessing. Part I think part of the frustration that you're describing is a negotiation that goes on while the problems are still manifesting next to you or around you, and and. I'm with two minds on this. Mind you, I don't have to live through it, so I, I understand that my, I, you know, my sympathies could have changed promptly if I had to live next to uh, some of the problems you are dealing with. But I actually agree with Dick Lowe. I actually agree with the sentiment of mainstream and agree with the sentiment of immersion. And, uh, and, and because and that doesn't come without real big challenges. The challenge is that you are experiencing more problems than anyone else in this room, other than these guys who do it on a daily basis, but it is what you spoke of, the respect and the dignity of all people. And and I think, if I may, I'm going to project and suggest that your frustration comes from the fact that you think it's taken away from your dignity and your understanding. Well, I guess I'm not Of him doing all this work himself 
and possibly maybe looking at a part-time position with another principal or a service member stepping in and helping out. Just, just one more. Let him finish. Oh. No, gee, I, I'm sorry. I, I, all I was going to say is, um, I'm sure that John would love to have some assistance and and, uh, and helping him coordinate services. It sounds like it. But the issue isn't the first responders who are Michelle and, and John. The issue is getting the people who are under vendor contracts with the Department of Mental Health yeah. to get them the resources. The extra half a person is best. There. Okay, my question is, if there is this problem occurring with different types of behaviors, and you're talking about different private agencies coming in, who apparently are assigned to whoever, okay? Right. Maybe somebody, one of these, can notify that agency to say if there is a problem, maybe no, we, we, do do we do that every day. Can I, can I just say and something? they don't come? When, no, no. No. When, when somebody comes to apply for Constant. housing, they come with their advocate, they come with their mental health person, whether it's service net, whether, whoever it is, and they come and they assure us, my, you know, my, they may have, you know, a small criminal history, maybe some, you know, drinking type things or some right. marijuana. But they assure us that they are being served and that they're going to have support and they're going to have services. Well, they'll become our tenants. And I've had a few within two weeks of being tenants. Guess what? I'm getting phone calls. I'm getting cruise reports. I so call they're not showing up. Well, I call the services and either the person refuses to see them or the services just are either gone or they've been transferred to somebody else, but we don't know who their caseworker is yet. So there's a lot of that happening. Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's very frustrating. The, uh, the folk singer Tom Lehrer had a song called Werner von Braun, in which one of the lyrics was, I send the rockets up where they come down, that's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Yeah. Um, we have advocates who are very good at advocating, and then it's not their department what happens after they finish that. And to clarify what I said about mainstreaming not working, yeah because we seem to get all of these mainstreaming mandates in, in every different department right. in the state and they provide us with nothing and you're supposed to do this and, and, and take care of these people and they, they do not provide you with the tools to do it and most of the tools is money is funding is to have people uh, all, all the time who's going to be watching this but we if we saw it at the at the west block how many times yes. already? Oh yeah. You know, I mean, it's not it's not just there. It's everywhere. I mean, it's an example is somebody who may need somebody to come and check on them, say four days a week or five days a week, are only getting maybe once a month, or they're getting once every three weeks. That's not going to cut it. That's not. Yeah. They're not yeah. going to get the support. Yeah. Okay. But I will say, I will <laughs> say, not in, in all fairness, I mean, there are a lot of tenants who have problems mm -hmm. that I that Michelle and I deal with that I can indeed, in all fairness, call up service and call up different agencies. I was going to give you a couple examples, just because I, I think that for the most part, people, the general public doesn't realize some of the true situations that we all deal with. We do have some great, yeah. all right. I'm going to give you one example. We do have some I great imagine, I don't have to tell me. Well, I want to give you one example of a situation with an elderly lady at Salva House. <laughs> who um, was starting to go into a little mental health problems and dementia. And what she was doing is she was bringing her laundry, her sheets and her bed linens, down to the laundry room with chunks of feces in the bed clothes. As a result, that feces got mixed in the, the washing machine and then went in the dryer. And of course, I had tenants coming down to me screaming <laughs> about the situation. So, that, so again, she was very hooked up with the Northampton DNA. She had a very good case manager from DMH. Uh, family was very involved. So I called all those people yeah. and made all those contacts. And because of that, the DNA, the DMH case manager, the family all got right on it and things were solved. 
and she no longer was bringing those soil that sort of laundry down. We love when they have supportive family, so, but that's rare. It's rare, yeah. Thank you for being here. Lisa's got five kids. She can. Thank you. Five kids? My God, I've got one. How do they handle that? I mean, <laughs> you're a father. I was, yeah. So I just want to give you guys an example of 1994 until 2003. Right. Four, 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 I just quit. My kids are little, John, maybe if you like them, you can. <laughs> yeah, that's those are ones that are done. So I'm so talking like, about the old Thank you. And after yes, the veterans are better, and oh, I know it gets a stance. And I'm yeah. dealing with the same right now. Just yep. be different in the past. For health insurance, portability, and accountability. Act. Thank you. Oh. So, yes, for, for all the frustrations, I mean, there are success stories that kids are indeed hooked up. Right. Well, I, I think, think, I think like with the housing yeah. authority, uh -huh. you have to do with a different type of diversity, no matter oh, where absolutely. you are, no matter who you are. And right. you need to look at the different types of behaviors, okay? Right. You need to have experience of dealing with behaviors. You just can't say, like, Eugene and I and Bill, we come to work for the housing authority. Okay, and we see these behaviors, you need to have experience on how to control the behaviors. And the contact and the use exactly. of contacts to who to call the, the right. And the authority, I don't think the authority is essential. I mean, these services that you provide are right. absolutely essential. So we're not, nobody's trying to say that, you know, well, let's I'm just not say don't get rid of the whole damn mess. Well, 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 I don't hear that at all. I hope no, not. I don't hear that at all. Yeah, I've never heard that. Because we're probably some of your biggest supporters. Absolutely. No, uh, right here. The, the city council has been fabulous. Yeah. Um, well, they're your constituents. Yeah. And you know them and so do we. Yeah. Um, and, um, no, you guys are very, very supportive. We thank you guys for everything that you do. I want to thank you for being here. And we'll see you again. Uh, I remember you when you were a cop. I wonder what the hell happened to you. I've been 19 years. Yeah. It'll be 19 years, actually, which is 19 years twice. My God. Thank huh? you, John. Thank you. As you thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Margaret, it's a pleasure to see you. Thanks, John. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Do you know Jack Tobin? <laughs> no, I don't think I do. He's about 55 years old. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's your twin, you don't even know it. Oh, really? Where does he live? He lives up uh, off of Ryan Road, I think, on Pioneer Knoll. Oh, He's my wife's first cousin. Oh, no kidding. No, no, no. Well, Jack Tobin? Jack Tobin. Okay. Yep. Jack, Thanks. All right. Nice meeting you. All right, we'll see you. I'm not going to take We're not done yet. Let me turn this back on now. Yes, yeah, so I got to get up a little bit. Are you running for president of the United States or what? We've got to have so much more examples. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to give me an Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. What is that? I'll give you a card. Is that something that is part of the disabilities group? No. Oh, I don't know. What is it? It's just a giant. Okay. I wouldn't hear it. I don't know. He's come to this. Right. That's not a good one. Oh, you're welcome. Never dull. Thanks again. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. See ya. Bye bye. Bye now. Okay, I was going to talk about the. Uh, we have no meeting in the office. Yep. Praise the Lord. In the month of September. In the month of September, we have some problems. I don't know. I just want to be sure because I didn't play that. This, this way. Come this door now. There you go. Uh, no, go up the stairs. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. Just go straight I'm kidding.